All right, good evening, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, December 12, 2022, at 7 p.m. here at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchick. Here. Member Weiner is absent. And Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide a public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket over there on that table to my far right. <coughs> I have allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. All right, we're going to start off tonight with a truth and taxation hearing. This is a public hearing on the 2022 property tax levy. Uh, at this time, I declare uh, the hearing open to allow members of the audience to comment on the topic. Um, but first, I'm going to go ahead and have uh, Mr. Dodd Trefall uh, make a brief comment. <clears throat> this is the uh, second year in a row uh, that the district has um, uh, gone through the truth and taxation hearing process. Um, truth and taxation is uh, when we in the levy for property taxes uh, that we use for the operation of the district uh, exceeds 105% of the prior year's extension of the amount that we were going to collect. Um, doesn't mean that that's all the money we're going to get. Uh, we don't know what the actual valuation will be. Uh, we actually don't know that until March or April uh, when the county clerks let us, let us know what that is along with what we're going to be receiving. Uh, but because of the CPI being at the 5%, well, actually, CPI last year was at 7%. Uh, we're capped to at the 5% level. Um, <clears throat> and we are unsure of what the new property and the overall EV EAV will be. Uh, the estimation is an increase of about 6.6%. Uh, um, again, the county clerk you know, brings it down accordingly uh, once you know, they have all the information <coughs> and collect all the valuation and so forth. Uh, so that's the purpose for the hearing. Um, in all likelihood, we might be doing this again next year as uh, CPI continues to be up uh, in that seven plus percent range uh, on a year, on a month, month by month, uh, year to year basis. So, with that, if there's any questions. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with the board. I know we've talked about this a couple of different times, but if there's any questions for Todd at this time, otherwise, I will go to the public. Thank you, Todd. Yeah. All right, then um, anyone wishing to be heard, please stand, come up to the podium, state your name, attendance area, or organization, if any, for the record, and please provide your comment. All right, then if there are no comments tonight, I now declare the hearing closed at 7.03 p.m. Right. This time I'd like to welcome El Sierra School. Uh, and we have the student council here with us tonight. I'd like to welcome you up to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I just want to let everybody know we'll be doing the pledge in English and then in Spanish right after. introduce our student council representatives. We have our sponsors. Uh, we have uh, Trisha Corsi and then Chris Marquez and then our student council um, you guys. our student council officers. We have Molly, we have Bella, Coraline and Cora. So if they could come up here they're going to be able to give our presentation. El Sierra was able to return to the traditional elections that have been held in the past. We, along the other three candidates, gave speeches to the students in grades third through six. They then voted, and the four of us were very excited to be elected. 
One of the best things about being in student council is planning the spirit days. Some of our favorites so far this year have been Silly Hat and Hair Day, Crazy Sock Day, and Red, White, and Blue Day for Veterans Day. We are looking forward to Pajama Day and Just Like Your Teacher Day. A special tradition we have at El Sierra is our Bobcat Friday. Two Fridays a month, students are encouraged to wear their Bobcat gear or blue or yellow. We check in on each class to see which classroom had the most participation. That class is announced at the end of the day and has the honor of displaying our Bobcat flag until the next winner is announced. El Sierra students really enjoy helping others. Earlier this year, we sponsored Socktober and collected 119 pairs of new socks to be donated to Sharing Connections. We are currently collecting new middens and hats for our annual midden tree. Later in the year, we will sponsor our Super Bowl. Students will bring in food donations and place in the box that supports their favorite team to win the Super Bowl. We always like to see which team El Sierra picks to win the big game. Now I'd like to introduce our PTA officers. We have Brianne Harris and Nina Miller. Um, so this past fall, we had our fun run, um, and that was one of our biggest, most successful fundraisers. Um, I think we had about 150 participants in the actual fun run, which was awesome for our little school. <laughs> okay, um, we have really enjoyed having our activities, our in-person activities happening again. We were able to do the ice cream social to kick off the year and then also held the Freaky Friday for Halloween and we actually just had our Breakfast with Santa and Book Fair event on Saturday. And we have had such an overwhelming amount of families, students and families participate that We've actually run out of ice cream, which is a good thing to have such huge participation. And our ice cream, um, our Halloween party, we had a line winding around the entire gym just to get into our amazing haunted house that our dads, who um, actually were brought to us by uh, Mr. Lynn and his dogs, DOGS program, <laughs> um, and they put together an amazing haunted house that scared a few of the small children, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then we um, just had uh, our, what is, oh, birthday books. So every other month, all of the students at El Sierra get to select a book that they would like to um, pick as a birthday present from the PTA. We support that with our book fair and um, we actually just had a successful book fair on Saturday, coinciding with our breakfast with Santa. We've also decided that we don't want to charge for fun lunch, and the PTA pays for our entire school to have free fun lunch. And because of our success with the fun run, we've been able to add even more free fun lunches throughout the course of the year so that no child has to feel bad because they can't afford to participate in fun lunch. Uh, we just got two brand new basketball hoops that can be raised and lowered. We've had the same basketball hoops that I believe were installed when our school was built. So we just got new basketball hoops installed over, I think it was Thanksgiving break. And you can see a picture of one of them. There's one on both sides. Um, and now when we have the um, Harlem Wizards, is that who it is, come and visit us, to promote the event that's taking place in January, we don't have to worry as much uh, for them breaking our mm -hmm. um, backboards as they slam dunk <laughs> during the assembly. Thank you. Thank you. I like this part because this is where we get to brag about some of the things we have at El Sierra. Um, we're very excited that we have lots of great leaders as you saw here with our sixth graders. Um, and one of the things we like to have is our sixth graders lead 
the beginning of the year um, how to do our little recess game. So they'll go into each of the classrooms and have the students come outside and teach all of our younger students how to play different games. We feel that if everybody knows the rules, there's, a re there's no reason to break them, right? Um, we also have um, recess leaders and our sixth graders and fifth graders um, volunteer their time during recess to uh, play the different games with our um, first graders, kindergartners, and our second graders. There's a picture there of our um, sixth graders doing the recess rodeo on the left, and the one on the right is our sixth graders um, playing duck duck goose with some of our kindergarten students during their recess time. We're also very proud of our Watchdogs program. The dog stands for dads of great students or any other positive male role model that a student might have um, in their life. Um, those gentlemen come to our school on Wednesdays and volunteer their time. Uh, we had such a big turnout for our pizza night, as you can see in that one picture there, uh, that we decided to have it be a half day program. So one dad will come in the morning and then one in the afternoon. So we get double the amount of uh, male participants but then also um, the real benefit for the students is they get an interaction with a positive male, male role model throughout the course of their day. Um, for a lot of the dads that come in, you know, they talk about being in an open school. You know, a lot of people has never experienced that before. So for them to be able to see it in action, they uh, gained a lot of respect for what we're doing within our school, but they also get to work with classrooms throughout each of the different grade levels, not just their own child's classroom. And that's been a benefit too, because a lot of times the dads will say that they see a lot of the students in the neighborhood, and now they know their name, and they kind of feel like celebrities in the community, which is pretty <laughs> cool. Uh, we've had a tradition of having our volleyball game of the two uh, students versus the staff um, every spring. Um, I'm very proud to say that we were able to continue that even during the pandemic the, you know, the last year. We tried to do a live stream so that parents could watch it that year. And, you know, but you know, honestly, it's been nice to be able to have a lot of in-person events you know, back <laughs> happening there. Uh, we're also very proud of our school families. Um, that's a social-emotional learning program that we have at El Sierra where each staff member has a family of students that are all the way from kindergarten all the way through sixth grade where we meet with them once a month doing different types of um, social emotional learning activities this year our theme is kindness um, so we're doing lots of activities with that um, the neat part about that is each adult um, has that same family throughout the students course of time throughout El Sierra um, so um, when our seventh grade or sixth graders become seventh graders we get a new kindergartner that next year and then we write letters to our um, seventh graders at O'Neill wishing them luck and trying to find out how they like their new experiences in middle school so it's kind of a neat connection um, students love it and so is our staff um, this year is our first year of having the entire elementary program of dual language in one building in our district. We're excited to say that it's El Sierra. Well, El Sierra has housed the dual language or parts of the dual language program over the year. It's neat to have kindergarten all the way through sixth grade. The neat part about that is the collaboration that's able to happen for our dual language teachers, as well as us being able to have the two-way program this year, which is starting at El Sierra for our kindergarten students. Um, and that's been neat to see, a two-way program, as I know the board knows, but for those of you in the audience, it's a program where we have native English speakers with native Spanish speakers all learning um, Spanish and English together. Um, it's been neat to be able to see that group do some amazing things so far this year already. We brought back our family reading night um, after the pandemic, and this was exciting because we put a new twist on it this year. Um, the first one was that we broke it up into two parts, so instead of having <coughs> a whole school reading night, we decided to have a primary reading night um, in November, and then an intermediate reading night that's going to be happening in January. And that was based off of the amount of uh, turnout that we've had at a lot of our events this year. We wanted it to be something where um, you know parents could, you know, not feel too crowded in one big space. But the other part that we added to it was adding the part to our school improvement plan where we wanted to go over different reading strategies that families could do at home. So our reading specialist, uh, Mrs. Dupass, led a parent session. While that was happening in the gym, the students were with their teachers doing read-alouds in the classroom. And then we had traditional activities after that, like a book exchange and a scavenger hunt. And families could also um, read books throughout the whole school. So it was a big hit. We look forward to having the second part of that with our intermediate students in January. New to El Sierra this year is our Bobcat badges. And this is a positive behavior incentive program we have for students, where as we catch students doing something positive, um, any adult in the school is able to give our students, you see a little cutout there of a Bobcat badge. We got this idea from our friends over at Lester. They have something very similar. Um, so we talked with them and got some of the information and then made it into our Bobcat badges. 
and that's been a couple of weeks in the making and it's been neat to be able to see students getting the badges putting them into a big bucket that we have in the library and then each week I pull a few of the names out and the students win prizes and things like that um, so the kids are excited about it um, but it's neat to have students come up to me and tell me Mr. Land I earned a badge today you know so it's just <laughs> that sense of pride is really cool to be able to see um, and then we have certificates the students will be getting too when they get their name pulled um, and then we're working on a way to be able to display all of the badges at some point throughout the course of the year too we have a couple of bulletin boards that I think will be some points of pride for us to be able to use too moving into the academic area uh, one of the things that I've been impressed at El Sierra this year and really the last few years is our instructional leadership team um, and that's with our staff members who volunteer to be a part of our school improvement process I'm um, using the cycles of inquiry we take a lot of um, deep looks into our data one of the things that we spent a lot of time at at the beginning of the summer and throughout the course of summer is looking at our map data um, and as you can see within there you know we have the green dot which means we're you know in that good area with math the yellow dot meaning we need a little bit of help here with reading and that's one of the things that we really want to spend a lot of time focusing on over the summer was what are some ways that we want to be able to improve not only our reading scores on map but really from what we're seeing in the classroom so that that can translate onto you know, our assessments that we take too so I'll get into that in just a few minutes um, as we you know, look at some of our other pieces of data here when we took a look at our um, IAR data uh, we had saw a little bit you know higher scores in terms of where things were ranked right there but we could still see that um, while math is a, you know, a strength reading was still a relative strength right there but it showed us that there were some commonalities between map and IAR that we wanted to really focus on reading this year um, that means obviously we're gonna have a strong focus on math like we normally would but in terms of our school improvement goals we chose to have two reading goals this year and I'll get in that in a little bit more detail after this next slide as you all know we got um, all the schools in Illinois had their summative ratings um, and El Sierra fell within the commendable range where uh, we're proud of that but we're not satisfied and where we want to be is in that exemplary threshold and our overall score was at 78.93 so we're just under four points away from being in the ex exemplary threshold and so we took we took a look at what can we improve upon in that rating right there in order to get up to where we want to be and some of the things that I know Dr. Russell's talked to a lot of the principals about were things that we fell in the same boat and you know, really looking at some of the easy points if you will uh, for us to be able to improve on that climate survey all of our students are given the assessment to be able to take but realizing that that is something that you know counts as points towards that overall summative de designation and making sure that every student even the ones who are absent have the opportunity to take that to take that survey um, would be one way to be able to do that just like for example if a student wasn't there for the IAR we make sure that all the students take that it's within the designated time frame having that same accountability for the climate survey would be something we want to be able to do um, while we got all of the points that were available for proficiency in ELA and math we know that we can still get better with that um, when we take a look at our growth areas in um, math and in, and in reading those are two areas there where while we had um, some of the points we feel we can capture a little bit more with some of the growth that we want to be able to get the other thing that's you know kind of <coughs> the elephant in the room there is the chronic absenteeism and that's something where you know all schools face a lot of different challenges with that um, so we're no different but really having those conversations with families um, you know about you know if there's students out there's lots of reasons for that but really being some you know empathetic to that but also just really reinforcing the importance of students being at school and so those are two areas there that we want to make sure that we really focus on and then looking at that area of growth when we take a look at our school improvement um, goals we continued our school improvement uh, goal from last year in reading and that was at the uh, K to 2 level looking at our foundational skills we wanted to be able to continue to improve that but then also with our um, intermediate grades working with vocabulary while we saw improvement in those areas as we looked at that data a little bit more we didn't want to just check it off and say move on to the next area and so what we decided to do be able to do this year was to continue having our small foundational group skills uh, meeting within our primary groups um, where that's a fluid amount of students that that go from group to group you know depending on as their levels increase throughout the 
um, each you know, few weeks. Um, so that individualized, um, or I should say that differentiated support that students are getting in foundational skills, we wanted to keep building off of that, but really having that focus with, with vocabulary. <coughs> And vocabulary goes beyond just the bold-faced words, and that's really been our emphasis as a staff this year, is that vocabulary is in all aspects of our students' education, um, taking advantage of you know, going over background knowledge from, with students and not assuming that everybody has the same background knowledge, but really trying to level that playing field um, so the students can access the vocabulary. It helps them to better understand all that they're expected to be reading within their um, text as well. And then the rationale from behind that was really going another look in our scores. Um, but then we also spent a lot of time, how do we get better at this as a staff? So utilizing our professional learning Mondays as well as our faculty meetings. We've had our reading specialists, our library, our teacher librarian and myself going over the importance of each of these areas, having teachers have great little discussions and then being able to implement those strategies within the classroom. It's been exciting to see that these last two years. Our second goal um, that we, based off of our data, we wanted to improve upon is in the area of um, informational text. And in talking with our um, teacher librarian and our teachers, our students really do enjoy reading nonfiction, so it goes beyond that, but it really goes into all the information that is on the text. The reason why the author put this picture um, on this page, taking a look at the graphs and the charts that are in there, the vocabulary that goes along with all that information in there, but then also taking a look at what informational text type questions look like on the assessments that students take, not only in benchmark, but also um, on the IR and in math, I'm sorry, in a map, and making sure that our students understand that this type of question is one that I do have to go back in the text and look at that chart that's there. That chart is not there just as a visual break because I'm reading text. It's actually there because we can get a lot of information from that. And then being able to analyze that information to be able to answer some of these questions. So, so those are some of the things that um, our teachers are working hard with with our students. And you know, the other part about that is when we have our you know, reading nights with our families, going over strategies that our families can use um, for read-alouds that they do with their own children, teachers modeling that within the classroom, really taking those breaks as some of those um, visuals come up, putting those up on the overhead projector, I'm updating myself here, <laughs> up on the Apple TV <laughs> with the iPad. I'm sort of thinking, sorry, James. Um, <laughs> we don't have any overheads, I promise. All our ink ran out, no. Um, but, uh, but the neat part about that is just taking advantage of the tools that we have within the classroom with you know, being able to walk in and see teachers doing that with some of the read-alouds or using the benchmark materials that we have. This is, you know, it, there's a lot of nonfiction heavy you know, resources that we have at our at disposal. Utilizing those for part of our school goals and being able to see some of the successes are huge for us. But then also when we have our um, parent nights, when we have like our reading night, having our reading specialists go over just some strategies that parents can use with their children at home. And that was a lot of feedback that we received um, at the end of last year is, you know, what are some things that we can do to help your school? Um, and for our school to get better, it takes all of us. Um, and I know that you know, there's a plan that we have here each month. And right now, on this Wednesday at our faculty meeting, our reading specialist and our um, teacher librarian is going to be going over a lot of high-interest nonfiction texts that our teachers will be able to utilize as read-alouds um, after winter break in, within their classrooms. Um, and that's going to help with our informational text piece right there. And I'm not going to go month by month because I know everybody can read that. Um, but it's really just having a focus and having a plan. I've been in this district for a really long time and I feel like our school improvement process is living and breathing you know, you know, so much better. Early on, I can honestly remember it would be something that we would make at the beginning of the year and hope that our goals got better by the end of the year. The amount of time and effort that our teachers are putting into this, the amount of time and effort that our parents are willing to put in this, it really makes it you know, that much you know, more worthwhile as we start to see these goals being achieved. So um, I know that we talk about you know, goals going from the boardroom uh, to the classroom, but I also think a lot of our schools are also extending that into the living room of families because they want to be a part of it too. And that's what I'm you know, seeing at El Sierra and I'm excited about that. And our two main rules at El Sierra are to be nice and do your best. So <laughs> we end with that. Um, but thank you very much. And I'm very proud of our staff and our students here. So thank you guys too. We want to thank everybody from El Sierra for being here today. And for our student council members, we have some gifts for you.
So thank you. And I have to say, you guys may win the best dressed award too. You even the headbands coordinates. <laughs> That's a nice job. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. All right, listed on tonight's agenda is one communication received by the board. Are there any additional communication board members would like to share at this time? All right, and that brings us to the spotlight on our school. Tonight it's going to be on capital planning. Todd, you're back up. So this is a, uh, a group effort. Uh, I started out and uh, I'll turn it over to, to others. So this is the time of year uh, that we would always start talking about facilities, next steps, moving on to the next uh, uh, fiscal year as we start uh, that process uh, really in earnest uh, when we come back from Christmas, from holiday break. Um, this year we're very, very fortunate uh, having had um, a very successful referendum uh, passage that we're moving into a, a kind of a, a new era and a new um, a new reality for the next several years um, for the district as uh, we work to execute on uh, those items that um, we put forth with the voters uh, for uh, for the sale so James if you could go to the next page oh I have to think I have um, he gave you the power this time. I have to get, yes. I'm, uh, I should be real honored. They don't usually even give that to me. <laughs> they didn't tell me, so I. <laughs> um, so uh, <coughs> we'll start out, though, uh, because it, it's going, we'll, we'll talk about the timeline uh, for that capital work um, in a minute. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, what we have planned for the summer of 23. Uh, just because we, you know, we need this time to plan and, and and to work through all of the the detail pieces for that large amount doesn't mean we we will be uh, not sitting around doing you know not having a lot working you know a lot going on this summer we will uh, fortunately in this last budget um, the funds that have been approved through the state through the DCO grants for playgrounds uh, were approved and are accessible for us for uh, a number of our, our schools. Not all of them yet. We still have a few that haven't been approved, and hopefully those will come in the next year. Um, we have abatement work pending the approval, waiting for um, the notice on the state maintenance grant. State maintenance grant is a $50,000 match from the state, uh, the district. This will be a little bit more on the district side, um, taking some advantage of, uh, of doing some of that work in the continually working to do asbestos abatement uh, in the basement of Puffer. We also have some, uh, some, object, some projects remaining from last summer where we had everything put in except for the chips that were delayed so many weeks due to supply chain issues uh, for the fire alarm systems. So we then turned on and hooked up the old fire alarm system. It has made it through the year so far um, and this summer we will then uh, finish that work and complete it by switching over to the new system uh, as well as complete some of the masonry work that was planned and started in summer of 22. So we wanted to show um, the board and the community uh, just how much uh, in funding we're getting from the state and how much um, our community is is locally fundraising uh, the 1.8 million dollars total estimated project cost that is that is a number likely to go up the only absolute number on this table is the state grant that those don't increase increase or decrease um, those are set in statute and uh, that is what is available for us in funding for those projects and they are very specific to site and, and the work being done um, we know and, and is on the board agenda for this evening 
uh, a number of donation uh, acceptances for the board from groups that have been raising uh, funds. Those are um, in, in there so that we can then start that process. We're ordering the equipment for those to get installed and then going forth with putting out and preparing the bids uh, to go out on the street um, to bid for that work and, and for those to be rewarded at, um, is it January, meaning that we plan to do that, or February? Some, Jan Some of them will come back in January for approval. So we know that, you know, depending upon on how those bids come in, uh, also how some of that fundraising is continually working and going, uh, that uh, some of that total project cost could, could increase. <coughs> I'm going, this is where we're going to have the team effort. We're going to bring in uh, Amy and Peter uh, from White and from Bully and Andrews uh, to start, uh, and Kevin, uh, to start to talk about the next steps in what is going on uh, and going forward uh, as part of the referendum piece. And so I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. So just as a quick review for the referendum work, basically there's uh, four distinct areas of focus, um, three, and then uh, kind of some follow-up building maintenance items. So the first major one is the additions to the middle schools to move sixth grade over. Um, that'll probably be the quickest thing that we get going. The second is the HVAC mechanical updates to all buildings. And the final bucket was the safe and secure entrances, um, followed by the uh, <coughs> specific building maintenance updates for the remainder of the work. Um, so just uh, wanted to touch base on that in this slide as a refresher from where Amy and Peter are going to talk about next. Well, yeah, we, every, every once in a while people have been, you're moving very quickly. I'm like, well, we've got a lot of work to do and, and we're behind <laughs> getting it. And we want to, you know, we want to, we've got a window, we want to get these things going. Um, the bond sale did take place. And the, as the board is well, well aware, uh, we ended up with uh, rates uh, under 4%. Uh, we, it is always good to be prepared and move ahead we were able to take advantage of an opportunity in the market where uh, after the election the rates um, improved uh, from prior to uh, the November election uh, and the week that we actually we went out they improved uh, from the, the week before um, they've gone up a little bit since next week they may go down again um, the rates that we have were 3.39 uh, as the number that the IRS looks at uh, all inclusive of costs and if the long years aren't uh, refinanced at all is about a 3.89 percent so under the four percent that we were looking at uh, in the weeks earlier uh, in the weeks up leading up to the, the election when you know things were above four percent at that point I'm going to turn it over to to Amy and Peter thanks Todd Good evening. Thank you for having us. My name is Amy Tiberi. I'm with White & Company. I'm a senior project manager over at White. Um, I will be District 58's lead architect on the project. I will be here from the very beginning now all the way through the end. In fact, I've been um, kind of in the background all the way through the project uh, and pre-referendum to help support uh, I am very vested in the community and District 58. I've worked with, with you guys in the past on the Leicester edition. I am a community member. I live in the Leicester community. I grew up in the area and graduated from Downers Grove South High School. And um, I was District 99's lead architect um, as well for just the, the referendum projects that just recently finished. Uh, very excited to be here with all of you. To uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on the next steps for the referendum from a design side. We have started kind of preliminary survey work. Uh, we are completing scans of both of the middle schools because of the size project that we're doing and the additions going on there, um, having the building scanned as well as uh, working on some survey work. We are working on uh, getting uh, undergoing and, and getting some site surveys, um, which I believe is on the agenda for approval to this evening, to look at uh, the both of the middle schools and, and get that work going that's in conjunction with village approval process. 
Um, and we are also um, starting to talk with the village about uh, the traffic studies that will be required at both middle schools and what that might entail in hiring an expert to, to look at that from a traffic end. First, we want to understand what the village will be looking at before um, we go into contract um, with a specialty consultant uh, for those traffic studies. We're going to be working with the district and the community and staff on visioning sessions at the end of January and beginning of February uh, to understand the needs as far as uh, the priorities uh, for the group. This planning process, as, as many of you are aware of, has gone on for several years. And so before we, in earnest, start designing, we want to hear from the community and staff and, and students, too, uh, about what the priorities are for these large additions and the, the overall project um, as a whole. And then we are, will be working in partner with um, your CM, Bullion Andrews, to align the uh, budget and scope to again confirm where we stand. We start off with, we know the community approved $179 million and we, we just want to make sure that everything aligns before moving forward. We're looking to start uh, major design work in the beginning of March, so that would happen immediately following that, that budget and scope alignment. That's after the visioning session, so by then we'd have our priorities, we'd have our, our budget and scope in place, and we can move forward on the design. Permitting would happen uh, fall of 2023 for a potential start of construction summer of, or spring summer of 24 with targeted completion dates uh, for the start of the 26-27 school year for all projects. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter over at Bully and Andrews to talk a little bit more on the construction side. Is it this one? Oh, it's that one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Chris, everybody. I'm Peter Kuhn with Bully and Andrews, Vice President of our Education Group. Um, I will really be involved heavily from day one until product completion, um, really overseeing the overall referendum project uh, to make sure it's an overall success for the entire community. Um, really just high leveling, um, as Amy said, we are really going to use the next 10 months to set up the product for success. So design, um, doing a lot of site investigations to make sure that when we start construction it can run smoothly and that we procure all materials um, on a yearly basis to make sure that we don't have any procurement issues and that you know, students and staff are within their classrooms on day one prior to start of school each year. So overall, really, we're breaking it down. I, I would call it two separate projects right now. It's the middle school additions um, that we plan to break ground in spring of 24. So we'll utilize the next 10 months from a design standpoint. We'll be coming back um, to the board in, you know, uh, late of 23 uh, for those award recommendations. And then really once the weather breaks, we would be starting those additions in the spring of 24, really targeting overall addition completion in um, August of 24. And then we would utilize that next summer, summer of 26, to really kind of renovate um, and bring all the additions and existing school um, together as one. And then our plan is right now is to utilize each of the summers, really break it down. Most likely we would do four schools each summer. So four, four schools summer of 24, four schools summer of 25, and then three schools summer of 26. What we're trying to do is group all similar work to, together um, to minimize the impact that we're doing at each of those schools. Um, so instead of trying to do projects at each school each summer, we're trying to minimize our impact um, and try to complete as much work as possible to really minimize the impact to staff, students, and the surrounding community. Um, with the you know, overall target completions of fall of 26, um, and then really we still have that one year buffer of 2027 to uh, wrap up any of the referendum work. So that's really a high level overall construction um, and referendum schedule at this point. And then I have the last slide. Um, throughout the process that led up to the decision of uh, focusing on our facilities with our strategic plan, after that with the citizen task force, and certainly determining whether we go to a referendum or not, we've involved the community at every step. And when I say community, I'm not only talking about uh, our families and the board, I'm talking about our staff members as well. And we're committed to continuing that as we go through uh, the construction phase of this project. So prior to 
finalizing designs with White and Company and Bully and Andrews, one of the things we think it's very important is to sit down with our staff and to sit down with our community and talk about these big projects. You know, for instance, um, secured entrances or gymnasiums or science labs, you know, and, and the list goes on. Show examples of modern work that we've done and then get feedback uh, prior to the architects finalizing the design. We think that's very important. I think one of the worst things that can happen is we get to the end and people go, you know, what were they thinking or why did it look like this? But to really get those themes out um, in the open, have some public discussions on those so that way when White and Bully and Andrews go to work on those things, they have all those themes, you know, in their head. They have the feedback from the school board. They also have the feedback from the citizen task force and then the strategic planning group. And, and so again, I, I want to reassure our staff and I want to reassure our community that um, involvement, feedback is a very appropriate um, course of action to continue on. We've had a lot of success with that and we want to continue that. Um, also, as we get to um, you know, finalizing construction, that's where we would also deploy things like user groups. So, you know, as we're finalizing the science labs, it makes a lot of sense to get the principals and to get our science teachers together to make sure that things are located in the rooms in the right spot. Um, you know, doing things like that uh, will go a long way when we uh, open the schools up uh, when they're all finalized. Also to do this, we're going to continue to uh, modify our calendar over the years um, to make sure that we create the longest window possible uh, for um, construction. So ideally, we'd like to carve out 12 weeks in the summer. I'm not sure we, we could always get to 12 weeks, uh, but certainly want to continue to target 10 weeks. And then also look for opportunities in the calendar year in, in terms of maybe we can do something over a winter break or, or a project over <coughs> spring break. Uh, throughout my career, I've always tried to utilize those time frames to do quick projects, even if a project means setting things up for the summer so they, they can hit the ground running. So we've been talking a lot about uh, those things as well. And what you can anticipate is each year we're going to bring that calendar back to you and then really try and stretch this summer as much as we can. Um, in terms of taking the breaks, we're still committed to trying to keep those two weeks at winter break and a, and a full week of spring break, uh, but really looking at how we're doing our institute days and other things a little bit differently uh, to make sure that we can maximize that summer schedule. Uh, so rather than getting out you know, the second week in June, I think our families can be a little more accustomed to around Memorial Day as close as possible, and then trying to push that August time back as far as we can, but still get in the required days during the uh, school year. So we're again, we're looking forward to continuing to engage the community. Um, now that the bonds have been sold, I think what the board and what the community is going to see is this planning process is really going to continue to pick up steam. Uh, we're excited about it. Um, things are happening behind the scenes, as Amy alluded to. Uh, we've already had people scanning the outside of our buildings. Next week over winter break, they'll be inside of our buildings. And so things are moving and uh, moving along right according to schedule. We will continue to update the board, you know, obviously at board meetings, but through Megan with Communicate 58 and uh, through other ways like social media in terms of our progress uh, that we're making and I would encourage people when those community engagement sessions become available to really consider attending those. Um, also, I want to reassure the community, especially around O'Neill and Herrick, uh, when we're talking about parking and traffic, that the community will be involved in that process. That's a process that is not done um, solely by the school district. We have to do it in conjunction with the village. And so we will be working closely with the village. And I think our community can expect a similar process to what District 99 would have done, especially around North High, uh, when they you know, changed the way Prince Street uh, you know, used to go through. Now it doesn't anymore, changing parking lots, those types of and we will continue to make sure that the neighbors are involved in that process as well. Uh, Dr. Russell, quick question mm -hmm. uh, since you were talking about it here. Um, we, we often already hear about our time frame in which we release our school calendar. Mm -hmm. If we're going to be, but they tend to be pretty steady. Yep. Uh, is there any possibility that we could look at escalating that process a little bit, get the, that out to the community a little bit quicker, if nothing else in draft form? Uh, so people can, can plan accordingly because if, if there's some days that uh, days off in the year that we may be removing to, to, to lengthen that summer or even the end of the school year um, anything that we can do I think to to alleviate that pressure on yeah. families would be better. I think it's a very fair question one that we do hear from the community and two things moving forward now that the referendum has passed obviously that's why the calendar is delayed now and we'll ask for approval in January um, I would expect that process to be 
rolled up, uh, you know, so we're doing that in November in, in December at the latest, maybe even sooner. The other thing that we want to work closely with Bully and Andrews on, just like 99, and what most districts have, have done is now they have a, a two-year tentative calendar. Uh, I always want to throw out that word tentative uh, because things can change in construction, um, but giving our family more of a heads up, um, you know, not only uh, one year out, but two years out, and, and being more aligned with what the high school is doing. Um, I've stated throughout our, our pitches on the referendum that um, the ultimate goal is to align our calendar with District 99. That would be the administration's recommendation and, and then really have a K-12 calendar through the community. Uh, but we are looking at rolling this process again forward by a couple of months next year and then also really strongly considering a two-year tentative calendar just to get those dates out for everyone. Appreciate it. Um, I have an easy question and a hard question. Um, my easy question is... Ooh, hard question first. I don't know. <laughs> out of the way. Um, the, in terms of the phases of, of the middle school work, um, just as, as a curiosity, when will, um, be the, when will be the first school year when sixth graders will be in, enrolled at the middle schools? Be the right yeah. So what we have said is we are targeting the fall of 2026. It's a very conservative yeah. target, yeah. which Everything would mean done. the current second graders would be that okay. first group in. We've been very consistent about that. Um, we've also said if we can, We'd like to roll that up. Um, I just can't commit to that as a community. So we said a very, very aggressive, maybe not a likely calendar could be this year's third graders. In reality, we did say this year's second graders. Now, as we're having conversations, one of the things that Peter alluded to was that, um, and Peter, please jump in if I'm getting any of these dates wrong because I'm speaking from memory. But the fall of 25, you would see the completion of the middle school edition, right? Um, that's the target. Whether or not that can be ready to go on day one, we're not certain yet. We need to continue to look at that because middle school additions, that work can take place while students are in attendance. What can take place is um, the renovation work that has to take place in the rest of the building. And so to, to be able to say right now in December of 22 that everything will be ready to go, including um, you know the renovations in, in by the fall of 25 isn't realistic. We think we'll be in a really good spot with the additions. Um, but in terms of the rest of the building, one of the things that we'll have to continue to review is, does that mean that we can still move the sixth graders over at that time, or do we need to wait until the fall of 26? So again, an aggressive timeline would be this year's third graders. Um, uh, a conservative timeline would be second graders, and that's what we were really upfront with the community about because we didn't want to overpromise anything. But that's what we're looking at. When are these additions done, and then when are the renovations done? And could school happen with sixth graders when just the additions are done, but not all the renovations are complete? That's something we have to continue to study, but we'll be bringing back to the board. So again, with the community, if I'm asked, this is the answer I give them. It's this year's second graders would be that first. Uh, grade level open. Maybe that wasn't such an easy question. Can I piggyback on that just for a second? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the addition would be done. Say we couldn't move the sixth grade there, would that addition still be usable? So would our those students still be able to use things like the new gymnasium, um, uh, items like that, or would that still be sort of disconnected and we'd still be kind of working in the old footprint? No, I think what you would see is that several of those areas would be accessible and you, you pointed out a really good one like a, like a new gymnasium so long as that they, that can be completed and we would get the occupancy from the village. Um, in terms of bringing everyone over there that might not be the possibility in the fall of 25 but certainly those areas as they open up we wouldn't let them just sit there. Right. We would really want to make sure that we're accessing those as much as possible in, in gyms and science labs um, would be really good examples of, of that work but again we need to continue to uh, study when those renovations could be done and to make sure that everything flows uh, smoothly with that okay Peter uh, Amy did I misspeak or no everything's great you just have to get an ROE uh, correct ROE thank you yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. for okay so my, my, my more challenging question um, would be as it pertains to the 11 elementary buildings mm -hmm. and I understand it from what uh, Peter said that we're going to focus on four buildings in one one year then four buildings the following year then three buildings in the third year um, how do you prioritize that especially when I when I feel like we're probably gonna get some feedback from the community saying gosh I'd really like you to my building to be in the first uh, the first go around and not the, the third go around how do we how do we uh, how do we rank and order the buildings I'm going to give you a short and a very long answer. So first, very carefully, right? Uh, second, though, we are kicking around different ideas. Um, what is not picking up momentum is like, well, we'll do the north side first or we'll do the south side first. Really what we're focusing in on right now is an approach that would look at um, complexity, 
procurement and then age of the facilities and so you know when we talk about which schools would go first to me a chronological approach makes a lot of sense I think people can understand that typically your chronological buildings are going to need the most work done first that being said it may take several years to get some of the equipment to those older buildings because of the uniqueness of those designs so we might be in a situation where if we can procure things faster the younger schools might go first like an El Sierra or a Bel Air because you know they're a lot simpler type of projects than a Whittier right but right now if we had to say okay well how are we going to attack this with assuming we can get everything going right away we would be looking at more of a age of the building first um, I think that's the fairest way to do that but again we're going to lean on the advice of our architects and our construction management firm um, and that's really what we've tasked them with as well to give us some examples or, or to, you know what would their prioritization schedule be like but as we speak right now we would emphasize those older buildings first because those buildings are in the need of the most uh, work and the most urgent work so um, that's the thinking right now but again those are conversations that we're hashing out a as we speak. So there'll be updates on those. So we'll kind of get like weekly updates on like use the weekly update as kind of a insight into that those conversations. Yeah, you're gonna as a board, you will continually be updated on the referendum. Um, you know, through our, our normal weekly update, you'll also be getting updates here at, at the board meeting for the public, and then also, like I said, through Megan's communication, that biweekly communication, what you can anticipate are you know referendum corners or, or something like that in those newsletters to continue to keep the community um, up to speed on those uh, decisions. I think what makes this very tricky is just um, the ability to procure material and the supply chain issues that are still kind of plaguing the industry and, and so again um, if we can get the materials then it makes sense to do one building first but what I can assure the community is everyone's going to understand the why behind the decisions we make I'm not going to say everybody will always agree behind those but our goal is to always make sure that the community can understand why we logically took that approach in terms of starting a building one of the things that we we did have good conversations about and i appreciate um, both white and bully and andrews is when we go into a school we want to make sure that we get it all done in the summer we don't want to do the hvac and then come back the next year and then do the secured entrances because when you have to start ripping up a building it, it just makes sense to do it all at once per building so that's the approach that we're we're talking about with the hvac though one of the things we are also entertaining and i, I can't promise anything as we start to knock out some of these schools with air conditioning to the greatest extent possible how do we redeploy those window units into other schools without overloading the electrical load so that even though some schools may get air conditioning first we might be able to air condition more spaces in the other schools um, you know as we go through so those that are a little later on in the batting order can at least start to um, also get some of that as well again without overloading uh, the electrical load in the schools but that's something that we're also looking at uh, to make sure that we do um, but again when we talk about HVAC work our newer buildings Bel Air and El Sierra do have functioning air conditioning in those schools so obviously they would be a little later on the list mine is kind of a follow-up to mm -hmm. all of that um, I, I, I was going to ask for more clarity on and I know that it's probably in the midst of discussion yeah. right now but more clarity on why not all 11 at once and working project by project in all 11 um, and you know what what it what are the main barriers to that is it project management is it procurement is it manpower yeah. um, and what are the ways to overcome those three things because um, you know it is difficult to prioritize these four schools yeah. then these four schools then these three schools you wait until the third go um, that's a really hard thing to do versus okay HVAC is this summer and everyone's going through the HVAC process and when we do HVAC we have to by nature of the way things work and a domino effect work on the electrical because that's your base systems right so I would just like a better understanding when when you're ready it doesn't have to be tonight but I'd like more understanding of sure that as well. yeah I will say um, we are wrapping up a five-year program at District 97 in Oak Park mm -hmm. um, so we've kind of learned very similar scope to this several additions um, HVAC upgrade life safety upgrades um, so we've learned a lot from that and I think the biggest thing is um, you know you you want to break it up into manageable sections construction in the local area during the summer months is very busy 
um, and labor is our biggest struggle. So ma breaking it up into manageable projects, which we feel four won't stretch the current market. Um, so breaking it up into that is really our recommendation, um, four summers, four summers, three summers. And really, we want to touch one school at a time. And um, if we're doing four schools, we would do similar work. You know, so you're getting an economy of scale from a pricing standpoint and competitive numbers from a subcontractor standpoint. Um, so that's really w why we're recommending breaking it up into to those uh, over those three summers. So we'd be bidding out four, then four, then three. Correct. It would be a bid for the three over the three years, the 11 over the three years. Correct. You would be breaking it up. So you'd be going, just bidding out summer of 2023, those four schools mm -hmm. get in the number, then White and Company preparing documents over that next, you know, 10 months to bid the next four schools in 24 and so on. Okay. But certainly one of the things, again, that we continue to, you know, challenge our partners with is, you know, how do we accelerate timelines and how do we do more at once within reason? Um, you know, again, we're trying to be very careful to be realistic with the community, but we certainly also understand the sense of urgency behind um, when you pass a referendum it, it's logical people in the community want to see tangible results as, as soon as possible um, and, and we we definitely understand that and so again we will continue to have these conversations we'll continue to bring them uh, to the board of education and the board will be the ones who um, you know approve all of these bid works all of the um, contracts and, and, and so on and so forth the materials yeah consistency is kind of my main Sure. concern because year over year if you're bidding year over year you're getting potentially different bidders different procurement chain different supply chains mm -hmm. different products um, different manpower so that's that's one of the things that I'd like to keep an eye on because you know I don't want this these four schools to get this and then these three schools down the line to get something completely different in um, their end product that was one of the things when I went through all the construction projects in, in District 181 yeah. because we couldn't build every school at the same time. But, but it was also very important that when we got to the end that what it looked like in one school was a very similar experience to what it looked like in another school, right? You didn't want to have completely different machines at one versus the other. And so that point's very well taken. Well, even just from a maintenance perspective, you know, like if uh, we can order and have on hand, you know, similar parts and, and everything else like that. It, it makes life a, a lot easier for our, our maintenance team. You know, they've had to do a lot of miraculous work over the last several decades of, of trying to keep really old equipment working. I think one thing they probably appreciate is to have uh, similar fixes, similar routines, uh, you know, throughout you know throughout the district. Obviously, different buildings are different sizes, so the, the scope of it might be a little bit different. But you know. Uh, similar parts, same brand, that kind of stuff. I think is will be at least that's the kind of stuff I've been hearing from yeah. from them as, as we talked about it. No, I agree. I think one of the other things that's nice too is our partners in '99 just went through a big project with White and Company, right? It, it, um, a big piece of that was fully air conditioning both high schools, and so I know '99 learned a lot from that. White learned a lot from that, and I think we can benefit from that knowledge. And, and the same thing with Bully and Andrews with their work in Oak Park and then Hinsdale Middle School. Um, you know, just building that that new school too will give us a lot of uh, information that we can deploy in our district. But again, lots of updates coming through our, our normal channels, but also really in those normal channels, carving out specifics for the referendum work that is taking place. I think it's very important um, that we have a dashboard type of approach to this work so our community, again, not only understands the why, but what can they see, even if it might not be in their home building, what's that work that's being done? And uh, so that is the challenge that's out ahead of us and, and one that we are preparing for as we speak. A question about um, a lot of the focus here has been during off times when students aren't in seat. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if either of you can speak to what the community should expect when students are in seat. Anything that's either visible or potentially small or large inconvenience, just to give us a sense for what could happen during the school year, uh, knowing that there might be some staging work that has to happen or prep work or maybe some small work that's possible while students are coming in out of the building. Yeah, I can touch that. I mean, really, the middle schools will be impacted the most. Um, the additions will be taking place throughout the school year. Um, you know, we need to meet with the staff, make sure that during testing days, things like that, we're limiting work on site. So, we're, you know, uh, 
minimizing the disruption to the to schools, but definitely we'll be building those additions while school's in session. And then really the summer months um, is try to do some enabling work, maybe some upfront work, investigative work during spring break, winter break, um, but really um, those 12, 10 to 12 weeks over the summer months will be the heaviest work. Um, and really when students return on day one start of school, we return the school back to its normal operating, um, so construction being complete. So one of the questions I was asked by Goldie and Andrews, and, and I appreciate the question is, you know, what's your tolerance level if, if a wall might just have to be patched over, but it's not painted perfectly during the school year? Eh? And, you know, so long as it's not disrupting the educational process, I encourage them to continue to do as much as they can and take advantage of that calendar. And, and so, um, again, when kids are in session, with the exception of the middle schools, you're not going to see a lot of construction, uh, but certainly you may see, um, you know, patchwork from the summer work they did or the break work. Um, you know, it'll look like things are under construction, but not impacting our, our learning. Um, but you know, again, we really want to capture those um, uh, break times. The other thing we're having conversations about are third shifts um, when it's appropriate to have people coming in at night, and then as long as the rooms are in working order that morning, um, you know, and as long as they're safe to do so, we want to also look at those options. And I know White and Bullying Andrews is already talking about that. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you. All right, that brings us to the reports to the board. The first one up is the superintendent report. So I'm going to move personnel to the start. Uh, one of uh, the things uh, Jane and I work very closely on is the school calendar. And so in the superintendent's report tonight, I want to preview that school calendar. And this is also up in board docs. So what we're looking for tonight is not action. Um, this is more of just previewing to the community and to the Board of Education what we're recommending for the school calendar next year. Um, any feedback we would then take and incorporate into our recommendation in January. And again, this is delayed by a month uh, because of the referendum. Uh, but now that we know the schedule moving forward, I, as I spoke earlier, you can see this uh, you know, moving up. So just a couple of overviews in terms of the school calendar that, um, you know, just reminders. Illinois School Code requires 176 instructional days. Two of those days can be used for parent-teacher conferences. Now, when you say two days, you can combine two evenings that would equal a day and then another two evenings in February equals a day. So that's how we get to the two full school days, if that makes sense. So think of each one of those evenings as a, a half day. Four teacher in-service days or institute days, those are in addition to the 176 instructional days. Uh, a school improvement day. And then again, uh, as we talked about earlier, when we look at the calendar, we're gonna be making construction adjustments, uh, trying to extend that summer as long as we can, but also trying to maintain that close alignment with District 99. We have a number of families who have kids in both districts, and that is certainly feedback that we've consistently heard uh, throughout the process. Also part of our contractual obligations is to make sure that we share this with the DGEEA, and we have done so, and we continue to have dialogues with our staff about that. So with that, um, you know, let's move into just kind of an overview. Uh, this is more just in written format. I'm going to go by this pretty quickly. And uh, I always prefer the visual. I think that helps. And so what we're looking for next year is we would start before the school year starts with two institute days on that Monday and Tuesday. Typically, we have a third day where our teachers don't come, but our support staff comes. Uh, we're going to skip that day in the calendar next year and bring all of our staff back on the 22nd. So the teachers will already be there, but bring our support staff back. So that way we can start the year earlier by a day and it will just help move that calendar up to end closer to uh, Memorial Day. So we're excited and actually I think there's going to be a lot of benefit to having all of our staff together in the district on uh, the 22nd. As you go into September, September really looks like a normal month uh, with the exception of Labor Day. You will see a difference in October. Uh, we are no longer recommending uh, during the construction season that we take Columbus Day. So we would be in attendance during Columbus Day. And again, the point behind that is to try and move the school year up as soon as possible. If you also look, we used to take things like that uh, half day school improvement day and things like that. We're really trying to front load all of those uh, days either before the school or put them afterwards. So we're not taking that during the school year. When you look at November, it's a typical November. So we'd be taking the Wednesday off prior to Thanksgiving. That's actually a compensation day for our teachers because of the evening conferences. Um, and then as we go into the next slide, 
you look at December, one of the questions we got, um, probably the most frequent question I get about the calendar is when is winter break going to be? We're in what I call the pendulum year, and, and we go, you know, this is the year where um, when the Christmas holiday falls, um, it, it, you can either go all the way up to the 23rd or you take the week before. We have taken the, the, the week before this year, and the reason we're doing that this year is we follow 99's calendar, 99 follows the recommendation from the Regional Office of Education. Next year, District 99 has that break period uh, the last day of student attendance would be the 22nd. So you'd be getting more time after the Christmas holiday um, than you would in this year's calendar. Um, anecdotally, that is typically what I hear parents um, and families prefer. Uh, so next year, you'll see uh, more in alignment of our traditional uh, winter break. Again, we don't build the calendar around just uh, you know the Christmas holiday, but we do get a lot of feedback around that. Um, then you would see January is a pretty typical month. February, again, what you would see there is, um, you know, you would see uh, President's Day off uh, because as we look through and, and trying to figure out all those days with parent-teacher conferences, that's why you see that. Um, March, I want to call particular attention to March because right now we have March 19th coded in that light blue. That is the primary election day. So right now that would be a day not in attendance. That is not something that, um, you know, we, we prefer to have to close down schools, but certainly because of security reasons, if we're having elections, uh, we, we really have to do that. I do want to let the board know that the state of Illinois is considering legislation around if you are forced to have um, your schools serve as attendance centers, you can uh, take um, a remote learning day on that day. Now, obviously, that's something that the board would have to discuss, um, but if we wanted to keep the continuity of instruction, that can be an option, and that would certainly be our recommendation given the construction calendar, but again, that would be a conversation we would have. Right now, you don't have the ability to do that, so I don't want to spend too, too much time on that, but certainly we'd have to have a conversation. I think that conversation would also be informed if we have remote learning days this year to see how those go as we move forward, because one of the things that we're not able to take advantage of is on that Friday the 1st, that is the Countywide Institute Day. And the Countywide Institute Day as a, as a teacher in DuPage County um, is something that's very valuable, especially for those um, courses or those subject areas that don't have a lot of partners to pair up with for professional development. So your music teachers, your art teachers, uh, maybe some of the advanced math classes that we have in our middle school, where that Countywide Institute Day is a day where our teachers have the ability to go across DuPage County and meet up. So for instance, when I taught social studies, we were always at Naperville Central and all the social studies teachers from the um, county would get together and do different professional development activities. So that's a day that our staff really like and we like as administrators to take advantage of. But because of this calendar, we're not able to do that because uh, our schools have to serve as election sites. As we conclude the school year, um, April is pretty much a straight attendance month. And then when we get into May, you're looking at the last day of school um, to be Friday the 24th, uh, which would mean we would get out prior to Memorial Day, uh, which I think might be a record for some time here in District 58. Uh, but that is um, you know, the result of condensing some of these, but still keeping those break periods. Um, we want to keep those break periods um, for not only alignment with 99, but we do think that's a chance to do a lot of pre-work for the um, summer work that's taking place um, you know that that following summer so with that we'll take some questions again this is not the official calendar this is our recommended calendar and uh, we can take feedback and, and go back to the drawing board uh, at the district office with that feedback and, and jane uh, i may have to ask you to help out here as well okay <laughs> questions nothing no? okay Can jane did i forget to highlight anything on this no okay all right. So that is the uh, personnel section of the superintendent's report. And again, we will be codifying that with a recommendation at the January 9th board meeting. All right. So as I get back into my superintendent's report for curriculum and instruction, uh, 
as we conclude the calendar year, one of the things that the district office is going to be working on are uh, staffing and programmatic recommendations for the upcoming school year. One of the things that we stated we were going to look heavily at if the referendum passed was full day kindergarten, and that work um, really is ongoing right now. So we plan to meet with our, st our teachers and principals uh, during the month of January. We also are having budget meetings over uh, winter break to make sure that this could be a doable thing. Um, but I would anticipate, um, if all goes well with those conversations, coming back to the Board of Education um, around the curriculum workshops in February and then in March with a recommendation. Um, if we're able to do that uh, instructionally and if we're able to do that with our budget again that is our goal and I know that we may have some parents asking that uh, question right now so if anyone is um, listening out there we want to meet with our teachers in January but we anticipate making that recommendation prior to uh, spring break we're going to skip finance because we just did the budget hearing and all of that. Uh, in terms of technology, one of the things that um, we are trying to deploy because it's a cost-saving measure and it's also um, a paper-saving measure is uh, a product called PaperCut. Um, <laughs> the, the name is interesting, but uh, what, what PaperCut does is it, um, before you print anything, um, it's a FOB system. So you don't just print from your computer and it you know, spits it all out, you have to go and you have to, to fob it in. Um, research has really showed that that helps reduce a lot of the costs and it's something we've been using at the district office for um, about six months now and, and using it very well. When we deployed it out to the buildings, uh, the rollout did not go as smoothly from the company as we had hoped, even though we did have some guarantees. Um, so we're working through those. I want to commend Jane, or excuse me, James and all of our teachers. Uh, we've had some struggles with that, and I think it's important that we point out we've had some struggles with that. Nothing um, that I would say on our end, but uh, again, with the company, um, it just didn't roll out as well as we had hoped, uh, like it did at the district office. And so we're focusing in on that. Uh, but if it can't work to the level that we need, it will be seeking a refund and uh, we will well, wait till the summer to uh, redeploy similar software so that's where we're at right now with that but um, uh, again we think it's a, a very good approach to uh, not only the environment but from a cost perspective but it does have to work consistently in order for us to uh, utilize it so James has spent a ton of time uh, you know after hours on this one and we appreciate his hard work uh, this is something we want to make work but it does have to uh, work well in order for us to do it uh, next up for student services, um, even though we're in the winter, uh, we're already planning for uh, extended school year. Uh, and so I want to thank Jessica and her team. So you're going to start to see a lot of stuff coming out for summer school and extended school year. And so um, if people have questions about that, they should be contacting their building principal. Uh, but we will also be uh, posting information. And then, of course, uh, for anyone interested in working summer school, we'll have lots of opportunities uh, coming up here. In terms of public relations, um, this is one of the, the greatest things about being in Downers Grove. Uh, we have so many organizations that are out there willing to help our families. Um, so I want to just take some time to recognize a lot of the organizations that have been donating to our students in need and our families in need. Uh, we have St. Joseph Knights of Columbus. Uh, we also have the Community Christian Church of Downers Grove, the EM5 Foundation, Sharing Connection, Stitches to Share, and the Downers Grove Moose Lodge. Uh, they contributed a variety of clothing uh, and other winter wear, so we're very helped with that. A Helping Hands Group has uh, personally done 60 coats, so we're very happy with that as well. Uh, St. Joseph's Giving Tree Program and the Downers Grove Junior Women's Club and the Downers Grove uh, so uh, Roadrunner Soccer Club has also donated how to gifts for over 124 individual District 58 students. Emmanuel Lutheran provided Thanksgiving meals to 41 District 58 families and they'll also provide holiday meals to uh, I believe 44 District 58 families. Uh, Good Shepherd Church has also been donating groceries, gas gift cards and many other things. And then finally the Blessings and Backpack Program at all of our elementary schools with our PTAs has done a great job and then we have uh, student councils and PTA programs also helping fund those in need. Uh, we're very fortunate to have such a supporting community during a time when many people do have needs and so that's meant a lot to us. The Education Foundation is also bringing back the Harlem Wizard, so please mark your calendar for January 15th at 6 p.m. Uh, it's always a fun night. The Harlem Wizards come and they, uh, you know, they'll face a very challenging team of the District 58. Uh, I think we're going to put up a good show this year. Uh, Mr. Lynn's going to lead us on that, uh, so we'll see how that goes. But, um, you know, uh, every time I played the Wizards, we've lost, but maybe this is our year. What do you think, Jason? <laughs> 
see. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great opportunity to come out with the kids and support the Education Foundation. And again, that will be at Downers Grove South High School at uh, 6 p.m. And it's a Sunday of Martin Luther King uh, weekend. So we're, we're looking forward uh, to that. We love the confidence, by the way. <laughs> In terms of facilities, uh, we've had a very challenging couple of weeks. We tend to have challenges this time of year when we transition from warmer weather to colder weather. You start firing up a lot of the uh, uh, heating equipment. We tend to get a lot of uh, you know issues from piping or coils breaking and things like that. I just want to personally thank our maintenance team, our custodian team, Jeff Newstadt, Kevin Bardo, the amount of work that they have done over uh, the weekends and at night to make sure that our kids have, at, can have school um, has been really extraordinary and I want to publicly thank them for that work uh, because we have had significant issues at Fairmount, we've had issues at O'Neill, we've had issues at Leicester, and we've also had issues at Herrick. It uh, kind of underscores the urgency for the referendum as well, but uh, without these individuals, uh, we have two situations in two of the schools where we might not have been able to have school the next day, uh, but again, just pitching in and making sure Sure we're able to do that so we want to thank them again uh, for their work and then finally on behalf of all of us we want to wish everyone happy holidays and we hope you enjoy uh, winter break it's hard to believe that Friday it will be here um, it's a very joyous time for so many of us and so many of us have more blessings than we can count but we also recognize that it's a challenging time for so many of our students and in so many of our families so if there is anyone that's in need or you know of anyone in need I would encourage anyone to counsel their or excuse me to contact their school social worker you can also contact the district office Megan Hewitt and we'd be happy to point you in the right direction to get you the assistance uh, that you need. So again, um, happy holidays everyone and uh, enjoy winter break. That concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you. Any questions or comments? No. Fantastic. All right, Todd, you're up again. We have now the monthly business and treasurer's report. It's not that bad, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look at the agenda, we have a number of things. It just happens to be one of those meetings where we've got a lot of uh, business items up. Um, I'll cover the year-to-date report real quick. Uh, you have your year-to-date report in front of, you know, in, in the packet. Um, we went through this at the, the Financial Advisory Committee. Uh, just as a, uh, things are going as expected, um, a, uh, one, one person pointed out and asked about the supply material budget in the education fund. Uh, that is where we had um, expended uh, and paid for uh, the iPads uh, that we received um, and paid for in, in July. Uh, we received federal funding for uh, a majority of that uh, out of a, a grant program. Um, those actually when we, and we will have to amend the budget at, at the end of the year uh, because we've had the referendum. We're going to receive um, funds and so forth and we'll have different expenditures in the capital fund so that will require a, an amendment. Uh, we'll also make an adjustment in this piece that it is uh, moved and actually um, because we took possession of uh, the iPads in, in May or June, uh, they're in actually the audit. Um, on a cash basis, we got the bill in July and we paid it and received uh, the revenue uh, in fiscal year 23. But in actuality, because we took possession, uh, those items are in fiscal year 22's audit so it's it's listed as such uh, the other thing I, I, I want to you have um, well, on the agenda the tax levy uh, that we had the truth and taxation notice for there's a new law that came into place uh, or that the, the legislature passed this year that it's it, it's not as specific as we would like to have exactly to understand what we're to do uh, but it talks about needing that a discussion of fund balance occur when the board approves uh, the budget and the tax levy on an annual basis. It takes effect, I think, January. Um, know that as part of the budget, the fund balance is in there at that time, and that every month uh, the, the board has a fund balance and a cash position of where we're at uh, at the end of the previous month. Um, we included it in the memo introduction piece uh, with the table as to what the fund balance is as of June, I'm sorry, as of uh, November 30th, um, just as a piece to connect it with the tax levy to cover uh, the, the law. Um, 
but know that that is something that uh, the district does as a you know as a course of business every month uh, and is available and certainly so um, I wanted to cover that piece uh, you have on your agenda a number of items um, for that we've talked about the donations uh, that uh, the community has been at hard at work and, and parents have been uh, raising money and doing a whole bunch of things uh, Kevin Bardo has been working with all these groups uh, as to how much is available and equipment and so forth in the budget um, and, you know we appreciate all of that and all of their efforts uh, that and then how much that is um, you saw the table as to what that means to uh, that playground piece those items were not it were in the master facility plan but not included in the referendum so there had to be funding uh, from some uh, place coming for those pieces um, the other action item the the item you have uh, on your agenda is the draft uh, audit and we have Betsy Allen uh, from Miller Cooper here uh, to talk to that um, just as a reminder piece the board doesn't approve the audit because it's an independent uh, third-party audit you accept it uh, from the auditor um, and we've concluded that process and so we'll bring Betsy up if you want to add Marty? you want to come up Sure. Oh. Sorry. That's okay. Um, regarding the audit process um, and how we, you know, we've, we've worked through that. So, and I would also note that the audit, uh, you know, is uh, also has uh, revenue over expenditures, as we showed in the cash position. Uh, there is adjustments because of you know some of the federal funding and so forth, uh, but you know we we still ended up in a positive position. Um, so I just want to quickly go over a few items um, in the in the draft financial statements. Um, once you guys accept the draft, um, there really should not be any changes unless you had questions, um, something that needed to change, and then we'll work with Todd uh, this week to get this released and filed um, with the State Board of Education um, by the 15th of December. Um, so there's three deliverables we're just going to look at tonight real quick. Um, the annual financial report, which is the bound financial statements, and then we have a required communication to the board letter um, and our management letter. Um, so I just I want to point out just a few items um, in in the in the um, annual financial report. A couple of things this year. Um, one of the big new Gatsby statements. Gatsby is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, um, and they um, the new Gatsby 87 came out, which was the implementation of lease of the lease standard. Uh, so we did work with the district to there's some added disclosures and some added reporting um, for for the leases that we did um, also something you really wouldn't see in the report but we do report the trs um, pension liability each year in your report um, trs puts out an allocation report every year um, that we use to uh, calculate um, some of the other assumptions and also to pull other contributions and also the trs li pension liability from um, it was discovered that there was some kind of error in their report, um, which stuck out that some districts had negative contributions that at times was leading to a pension asset for TRS, and we pretty much know that nobody has a pension asset with, with TRS. Um, we as a firm, and talking to some other firms too, um, decided that unless we had a district that had a net pension asset, we did not go through the whole recalculation to make another estimate another estimate so um, because it's a cost-sharing plan if somebody's number isn't quite right in it it's po possible that the estimate of yours is not quite right but from calculations we did there was nothing material that was going to going to change so we used the numbers that came um, from TRS and TRS was a, is aware of this issue and uh, they made the decision to leave the report as is so hopefully next year they will um, get on that and get it corrected um, so in, in the copy of the annual financial report the one thing you will not have in a draft is our independent auditors report that's our opinion on the financial statements we do not put that in the draft of the financial statements 
Um, it is this year, though, again, an unmodified clean opinion that we will be issuing um, with the financial statements. Um, and pages 6 through 14 of the document is a management discussion and analysis. I always tell uh, people who are not don't like to read a bunch of financial statements that if you just want an overview of the financial statements, the MDNA is a great place to go. Um, it's written by management and reviewed by us. It does have um, a lot of um, financial highlights in it. It gives an overview of the financial statements um, that are in the that are in the in the document. It also gives condensed financial statements um, as well as some factors that will bearing on the district's future. Um, I know Todd did end up putting some stuff in um, on the on the referendum to have that um, out there and ready to go. Um, Can you pause just yeah, for a second? Yeah, sorry. Um, I don't see the full audit on this meeting. I have it from the FA, FAC meeting, but I don't have, like, we have the, the recommendation document and we have the, um, we have the full audit. Was it on the agenda for FAC? Yes. We can include it. All right, then I can put it on right now. Maybe I have a different We'll go ahead and read post that so it's on there then. Oh, it's marked as incomplete work. Is that the same one you'd want? One moment. No, because I have one that says no, final Todd, draft. We, I have one no, that Friday we sent out. Um, yeah, we have the one a, like final a, draft. A draft. It actually says draft on Yeah. It. Okay. And not the one you saw at the. At the FAC. Yeah. Yeah. So, Todd, will you send it to Melissa yep. and then Melissa can post that updated one? Yes, I will. Thank you. And there was nothing. Get, I think I asked the question last yeah. year. We used to get physical copies, yeah. Yeah. Well, we haven't issued the final okay. copy yet, and so that's why it's just in draft. It's just in draft form right now, and so will. those bound copies okay. come after the um, yeah after the final one is issued. I understand we just accept, but I mean it, yeah. it is nice for us to have sure. an opportunity to go. Sorry, especially I didn't, through know, that. I didn't know you didn't have. Yeah, it. no. <laughs> and, and I went through all this already, <laughs> yeah. and so like I, you know, I and I should I should have caught it earlier. I I didn't, so I. I I want to pause. I want to make sure before we continue that everyone has at least an opportunity to open because you're referencing page numbers, yeah. Page numbers in that in that one key section and everything like that. So I want to make sure everyone's getting an opportunity to see that. And for the for your finance committee, um, there was nothing that changed between the product you saw on Friday morning to the one that I sent out Friday afternoon. And when you and I spoke, you had alluded right. that you didn't expect anything right. to change. So I wasn't overly concerned about it, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, now you're Word docs have been really slow to it. Okay. Yep. Are you going to put that under 16B? Yes. Yeah, you'll have to refresh your screen from board docs, which will kick you back out, but then <coughs> go back in and it should be there. I don't see it yet. Did it finish up one? I replaced. Yeah. You oh, that's this, okay. Yeah, so the yeah. second one that says uh, Downer School, yeah. School District 5822. Uh, I expected a third document to pop in. Draft. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. It's still going to say draft because it's not. No, no, I, the draft part is fine. All right, perfect. Thank you. We good? For your patience. Okay, yeah, I appreciate sorry it. Sorry about that. Um, so if you have the document again, so like I said, I think pages 6 through 14, I said, was a management discussion and analysis 
um, that is a document to go read if you just want an overview of the financial statements. There's some condensed financial statements, um, and there's also a um, some information which we refer to as factors bearing on the district future. So it could have financial implicate, implicate imp why can't I say that word tonight? <laughs> Implications. Um, so there's just a, a number of items that are listed in that section too. Um, so then starting on page uh, 15, 15 through 23 are what we refer to as the basic financial statements. Um, starting on page 18 is the fund income statement of the district. That's probably more the income of the statements that you're used to seeing on a um, on a monthly basis. Um, as Todd did report that you did end up um, with an increase of your fund balance of about $481,000 to about $35.5 million. A lot of that increase in the fund balance was due to the sale um, of the Longfellow School. Sorry. Um, then on pages 24 through 73, those are the notes to the financial statements. Um, here you're going to see the summary of significant accounting policies of the district. And there's also a um, number of pages, um, more detailed information to explaining the numbers that are in the basic financial statements um, on the cash and investments of the district, the capital assets, the debt of the district. Um, there's also a number of pages on the pension liabilities, which are for uh, TRS and IMRF, as well as the OPEB, OPEB are your other post-employment benefit liabilities. And that is the THIS, which is the health insurance part of TRS. Um, along with the, your retiree health plan that you hold. And then uh, rounding out the end of the report, starting on page 74, uh, the remaining sections of the documents are the required supplementary information and the supplementary information. Here you're going to see some multi-year schedules on the pension liabilities and OPEB liabilities um, and on the contributions to those plans. Um, you also see budgetary schedules for each of the funds maintained by the district. Those schedules include the current year budget compared to the current year actual. And we also present the FY21 actual numbers for comparison purposes. And then the final schedule in the document, there is a, there is a schedule of principal and interest payments um, on the dates that they are due for each of your outstanding, um, each of your outstanding bond obligations. Uh, then we also have our, our two letters that we issued. Um, one of them is our first one is our required communication to the board letter. Um, here it states that we've done our audit in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, also in accordance with government auditing standards, which is required by the State Board of Education, um, and also in accordance with the uniform guidance. Uniform guidance is a single audit. Um, since the district expends more than $750,000 in federal funds, it is required to have um, a single audit performed. And this year our testing was done actually on the new fund, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, um, that you received money for that Todd had referenced um, a few minutes ago. Um, page two of the letter talks about the um, GASB statements that were adopted this year. We talked about GASB 87, uh, the other statements that were effective for the district this year really did not have any um, uh, did not have any significant impact on the district at all. The next section of the letter um, shows the Gatsby statements that will be applicable in future years. Many of them will not be, a, be applicable or effective for the district, but we do list all of them. Uh, next year, Gatsby 96, which is a subscription-based information technology arrangements. Um, which is sort of a takeoff of the lease standards, but for subscription-based technology um, will be effective. So we will start working with the district um, early in the year to make sure we can start gathering the information needed to implement that. Um, again, this year we had no difficulties in uh, completing the audit. I want to thank Todd and his entire staff for their help uh, during the audit and getting this out timely this year. And then when we do um, get ready to um, release this report. Uh, we will have management sign our management representation letter and then uh, file all the required filings with the State Board of Education and the single audit um, as, as, soon as, we, um, as soon as we release the report. Um, the last letter that we, that we have issued is um, our, um, our management letter. Um, we are not reporting any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. Um, we had a few items that were just control deficiencies in regards to some certain matters. Um, I have talked to, to Todd and he um, will be providing his management responses um, to the board um, on, these on these matters. 
Um, we also have in here a um, just a comment or a management advice, we call it, in regards to technology and data risk security. It has, we put this in all of our clients and all of our corporate clients' reports, and it's really just more of a reminder just to ensure that you're always staying up on your technology and looking at your data risk security. Um, you know, we do look at certain things and that passwords are being used, um, but we certainly don't do a, a data security risk audit <laughs> at all. Um, but don't take this at all that we're saying there's anything wrong with your data uh, security risk or technology. We just want you to remember to always be, you know, staying, staying on top of that. And just one thing to uh, piggyback mm -hmm. off, that is something that Dr. Ike Miller is, you know, continually looking at in terms of not only things like our password security, but an audit of the entire system to ensure that we're as protected as we possibly can be um, as a school district. Mm -hmm. And like I said, that's the, the point of our comment too, is just to, just, just as a reminder, not to say that there's anything um, that, that they're doing wrong, that you're doing wrong in the district. When you, so. um, you mentioned that there, you have point out some weaknesses or deficiencies. Mm -hmm. Where in the document do you um, list those? That, I don't, that's in the letter that I've got. It. That's a letter you don't have yet. Okay. So. All right, good. So yeah. Todd will share that with we'll you. We'll share that and then we'll put we'll put we'll give that to the board with then what we're doing. Okay. We like we like to we like to address and go through those with the auditor and then okay. put Fantastic. through our process so we will send you our response of what we're doing to cover all of those things. Okay. So the board will receive the full Their copy of yeah. all of them. And like I said, we're, there was no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies. That's sort of you know the higher level deficiencies that we have. There were just a few minor things that we wanted to point out right. to the district. And mm -hmm. and if I used the wrong the wrong terminology, no, the, <laughs> <that's> yeah, <okay. laughs> I, I didn't mean. And, and I, I some of it's specific to how we uh, uh, deposited and journal entried in some of the uh, the federal funds and how they came in, uh, and doing the, you know and, and categorizing those things as they you know because some different formats so those are some of the pieces and then some of the depreciation and how we need to verify when we're del deleting we sold like a couple of vehicles that had a value of five thousand dollars and taking them off the list and so forth with our capital assets and something so. else Todd and I have talked about in the last couple of days is in regard to the capital assets and the accounting uh, just with all your projects that you're going to start having and um, getting together sooner rather than later to make sure that we, that the district has a good system set up to start tracking these projects because you're going to end up reporting a lot of construction and progress for the next three years. I mean, but I've been listening tonight that you know, this is going to take three years or so. You know, so there'll be a lot of construction and progress, and then stuff moving to be depreciated. Um, so I think it's really important that the district stay on top of that and make sure they get a good accounting going now um, to, to keep track of those capital assets. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions or anything else that we want to discuss? I appreciate it so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And then, Todd, does that conclude? That is um, all we have, uh, unless you have questions. We do not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That brings thank us you. to the committees. Uh, first up, uh, the policy committee did not meet uh, since the last board meeting, but the legislative committee did. They met on December 7th, so Member Hannes. Yeah, we had a pretty brief meeting on the 7th. Mostly we uh, spent our time talking about the upcoming legislative breakfast, which is going to be held early February. Um, we spent most of our time talking about the formatting of that breakfast and kind of bouncing back ideas back and forth in terms of um, what we found kind of most valuable over the past couple of years and how we can tie all that together. Um, for this legislative breakfast in terms of large panel discussion versus small group discussion with all the legislators that um, we're going to be able to bring to the breakfast. I think as of now or as of that meeting anyway, I think we had around five confirmed legislators who are going to be in attendance, um, but we haven't heard from everyone, so we're kind of waiting to see. Um, so it should be, it looks as though we're going to have, a, you know, a very nice turnout for the breakfast as we always have. and. We kind of settled on keeping a similar format that we used last year where we have a large panel discussion in the beginning where um, all of the legislators will have a chance to respond to one or two questions um, that they will all, you know, the same question that we'll get to hear from everyone on and then break up into those small groups again and have, um, you know, more of a discussion back and forth um, conversational dialogue between the people who are attending and the legislators. Um, we did talk a lot about 
um, how we can extend the question and answer portion for both the large group and the small group because that seemed like from the feedback from last year that was the biggest thing that everyone would just wanted a little bit more time um, to hear from the legislators who were there so we've talked a lot about trying like shortening the early meet and greet mingle period a little bit perhaps starting a little bit earlier for people who want to come and mingle more they can come a little bit earlier and then beginning the actual more presentation part of the breakfast earlier at like 7 30 as opposed to 7 45 or 8 o'clock as we've done in the past so trying to just give a little bit more time for hearing from the legislators and that was pretty much it we didn't you know next we, our next meeting is going to be focusing on the questions for the legislators and the topics themselves and so this was more format based mm -hmm. Kevin, like I yeah no the only other thing i would add is that uh, date is february 3rd mm -hmm. um the official start would be 7 30 it would conclude at nine once again that's february 3rd and obviously we'll be putting that out to the board emily i think you uh, you summarized everything uh, perfectly so uh the only other ad emily we did check out that february 3rd date just to make sure that that didn't um you know really it wouldn't cause uh, legislators not to be there because they technically are in session. Right. I know Megan reached out uh, to Representative Tara Costa Howard. We got some good feedback that uh, they don't believe that that would impact attendance on that date. So I think we're good to go with the third. Of course, we will have a um, snow date uh, just in case on those days. Uh, I believe that's the 17th. Is that correct, Megan? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so other than that, we're moving forward on it. Yeah. Any questions or comments from the board? All right, that brings us to the Financial Advisory Committee, which met on last Friday, December 9th. Um, I, my report's going to be rather boring because it's sort of been the whole focus of, of this meeting today. <laughs> but we did go over the year to day report. Um, we did have some, it, that's always a great opportunity for us to talk about because it, it's a good group of people that will take a look at. Um, our year to day report always shows where we are percentage wise for the year, so it gives us an opportunity to kind of. Uh, see if anything's out of line and have a short conversation about it. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the bond sale, um, not, not only the bond sale now. What, what is the number at 129? The total collection, total amount that we will receive at the end of the month is $140 million. We sold $125 million of par, and the remainder is premium, uh, which is where someone gives you a hundred, you know, more than more than the cost or more than the the value of the bond um and so then we've, we've expended 125 at this point right. so we, we we can go up to 179 so we expect within the next two to three years it will go out for the for the rest of that one of the conversations we had <coughs> was at what point in the window should we start looking at um start paying attention to those bond rates because there's gonna be a period of time where um when you take we have five years to go out and take the bonds, and then we have three years to spend them once we take them. So we've now we've done the first part of it. So there's going to be a window that will start at some point that we know that we'll be able to spend the remainder of the money within the, within the um, within a three-year period. But we don't necessarily need to grab it yet. So it's it's important to to there's going to be a window where we start looking and, and making sure that we're looking for favor favorable bond rates uh and those kind of things so we had we had some nice conversation around that we also did spend some time on the fiscal year audit um as well we went through some of the sections and, and, and we talked about a lot of the same stuff that you heard here that we got a little bit more detail we really talked about that that main opening set sec, uh, section and then um we talked about the, the capital work this summer and a little bit about the timeline the timeline that we re reviewed today uh, on construction as well as uh our future our future for capital planning so really all the stuff that we kind of touched on today but it was really nice to get the perspective from the advisory council uh, any comments no sir no. any questions all right and that concludes my report uh, the district leadership team met on november the 21st uh number Joshi? yeah i'll uh do a, a quick overview of the things that weren't touched on today and then, Kevin, if there's things that you want to add in as I, as I talk, talk to them, please feel free to. Uh, uh, goal one, curriculum and learning. Uh, we focused on uh, the outstanding KPIs uh, and the work that's coming up next past academic uh, efficiency and growth. The other KPIs that come up are things like collaboration and critical thinking that we've talked about uh, and how to set the right targets uh, for, uh, for those KPIs. Uh, that work is going to be ongoing through uh, uh, committee work. The curriculum council uh, will be will be doing that. Um, 
On goal two, uh, we got an update about uh, community members that have been placed into various board uh, and district committees. Uh, so we have 50 new community members that uh, applied and were placed into uh, various committees across the district. Um, and uh, the, in particular, the Superintendent Community Advisory Council will be uh, weighing in on uh, both the um, referendum uh, execution planning and the strategic plan that's coming up. Uh, and so on that strategic plan, uh, Kevin walked us through a draft timeline for what we can expect. Uh, he's going to be presenting to the board on the strategic plan uh, steps. Uh, and so uh, that was a helpful preview for us uh, to get a sense for, uh, as we all know, the, the past strategic plan has now expired and we will go through the process now of, now that we know the referendum has passed, on what comes next. And so Kevin walked us through uh, the steps including community engagement and otherwise to uh, to, to land that uh, strategic plan. Uh, Kevin, feel free to weigh in on that if there's anything else you want to share before I share other updates. Yeah, no, just a, a general reminder that uh, the strategic plan is coming near its conclusion and so we will be seeking uh, community engagement and feedback on a new strategic planning process. Uh, in late December, early January, we have targeted to send out requests for proposals uh, for strategic planning. So as we get those in, you know, what we're really looking to do is to seek board approval, either at the February or March of that um, RFP uh, request for proposal. And, and uh, you know, what you can anticipate is post spring break between then and June is finalizing those big key areas of the strategic planning process. And then our team would work and fine tune that over the summer and then bring that completed work back to you next fall. So uh, we're really excited for this work. It's, it's a lot of work, but um, certainly something that I think um, this board and the community have demonstrated that if you have a really good strategic plan, you can get a lot done. And uh, that is certainly what we're uh, you know targeting for and looking forward to uh, getting that work done. So again, between now and spring break, we'll be identifying that group or, or person that's going to help us with the strategic planning process and uh, those key areas. And then post spring break, we'll be uh, really completing that work. And then the summer projects, we'll be fine tuning all of that and then bring it to the board for uh, next fall. On uh, goal, thanks for that, Kevin. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on goal three, uh, we had, uh, an, there was a, a lot that was already talked about today, so I won't retouch on that. One thing that we didn't talk about today was the update on the shared village and district administrative center uh, that's happening uh, outside of our uh, outside of our meeting today. Uh, that work uh, continues to go on schedule. Uh, it be on schedule and completion is expected to happen in the first quarter of 2024, uh, with the district moving into that space in the third quarter of 2024. Um, so that was a, a good update to hear. Uh, well, we talked a lot about upcoming construction projects. These are existing construction projects that the village will benefit from uh, for years to come. Uh, and then uh, Kevin touched on this a bit uh, earlier, uh, but just wanted to name, uh, we talked about the visioning sessions that the community will uh, have an opportunity to engage in and the superintendent's advisory council will, uh, community advisory council will be uh, providing uh, the administration some guidance on how to structure those vis visioning sessions that will happen uh, in early 2023. Uh, but all as we think about all these projects that uh, you know White and Company and Bully and Andrews have been supporting, uh, will be supporting us with, uh, there will be opportunities for uh, individual school communities, uh, particularly the ones that are impacted most by uh, uh, traffic changes and large expansions in their neighborhoods. Um, we'll have an opportunity to weigh in, and the community as a whole will have opportunity to weigh in on key topic areas uh, as we think about uh, changes to school buildings and changes to the middle schools and things that they want uh, to see. Uh, uh, and weigh in on as uh, as a form of input. Uh, so we're excited about those, and it was, it was helpful to hear uh, the thoughtful planning that's going on to think about how to structure those sessions in a way that's an appropriate entry point for a community member that both may be actively involved in the work that we're doing, but also the community members that have just heard about this news and are starting to want to ask questions. And so um, looking forward to those sessions uh, in early 2023. Um, and that's the update. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Last up, we have the Health and Wellness Committee. Uh, Vice President Harris, you yep. guys met on December 8th. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I think the last time I gave an update was maybe at the October meeting right before we um, voted on the premium increases. And I gave a rather uh, sanguine 
um, update on the health of our of our plan in calendar year 2022, and uh, that's been revised um, <clears throat> in a more negative way. Unfortunately, um, our expected um, we're still expected to have a surplus, but just won't be quite as as robust based on um, the way the market is. is uh, is, is performing right now, um, and the outlook for 2023 is is also, um, you know, not very rosy. There are certain market pressures that are impacting the uh, the, med the the health insurance market. One of them is prescription costs. The other one is um, hospitals. Um, the, the nursing staff at hospitals. They are they are, there's a shortage of nurses, and the, and it's going the uh, the hospitals are finding themselves having to increase their 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 salaries and benefits for their nurses in order to retain them and that's so that's going to be, be impacting um, the market across the nation so that's something to brace ourselves for as we look forward to the next calendar year um, one good thing that I, that uh, I think is a, is a minor celebration is um, the our, our um, HSA plan we effectively have two plans with the universal PPO plan and we have the HSA plan the HSA plan is four years old or thereabouts Todd yeah yeah that's correct so um, and this is, um, we, our, our, we just went through open enrollment. Our, our membership on that plan has increased by 67% um, this year, which is great. And that's, that's, that's um, you know, the, 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 um, the committee is really excited about that because they, you know, the, the sentiment of the committee is this is, this is good for, for some of our members who, um, for the members who this makes sense for, this is a good, this is a good option for them. And it's, it's for the board, it's a good option too. It helps us control our costs and helps us to provide um, Good benefits for our for our staff without breaking the bank. And um, last thing, just um, as as we as we completed that meeting, we just kind of discussed about looking into the future and, and how this committee committee is going to meet. We have been meeting mostly on a monthly basis for uh, the past couple of years. I think we're going to go to uh, every other month going forward. Maybe maybe meet five or six times through the school year, and then um, so just we'll, we'll still have data that the board can review on a regular on a monthly basis, but maybe fewer updates for me, but not not too many fewer, just a couple. Wonderful. Questions or comments? Thank you, Greg. All right, we have no discussion items tonight, so that brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. The board is allotted 30 minutes tonight. We ask you to keep your comments to three minutes to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. Do we have any cards tonight? Okay. So we don't have any cards, but I will open the floor if there's anyone here who would like to make a public comment. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so that brings us now to the approval of minutes. Uh, are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right. Um, then is there a motion to approve the minutes of the November 14th, 2022 meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the November 14th, 2022 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the November 21st curriculum workshop as presented? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the November 21st, 2020, uh, November 21st, 2022 curriculum workshop as presented. We have our consent agenda. Is there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right, then is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel, uh, yeah, personnel report and financial statements and consisting of the list of bills and summary? Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Olchek. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right, our recommendations for action. The first thing up is our 2022 Certificate of Levy. Is there a motion to adopt the 2022 Certificate of Levy in the amount of uh, $66,315,000? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried to adopt the 2022 certificate of levy in the amount of $66,315,000. Next up is the fiscal year 2022 audit report. Is there a motion to accept the fiscal year 2022 audit report as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? 
Melissa, please go roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchuk. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to accept the fiscal year 2022 audit report as presented. We have a recommendation for purchase, the Navigate 360, the Alice Training, uh, which is for Alice Training, uh, to purchase that. Is there a motion to approve the three-year contract with Navigate 360 for a total cost of $31,550? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? All right. Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the three-year contract with Navigate 360 for a total cost of $31,550. Uh, next up is the Raptor Visitor Management System. Is there a motion to approve the three-year contract with Raptor for a total cost of $41,548? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? Just a, a question on when are we intending on um, implementing? So that implementation, we're looking at uh, March, April implementation date after we've trained our secretaries, after we've uh, clearly community, or communicated excuse me, to the community how different it is going to be. In, in reality, we are more than likely going to target that spring break date. It's always a good time to implement something new after a break period. Um, so that is the tentative timeline that we're working under. Okay. The only thing I add to that is okay, there might be one or two buildings that come in earlier than others. To test it out. As a pilot. Thank you for that, Jay. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. I have the motion carried to approve the three year contract with Raptor for a total cost of $41,548. Next up is the donation agreement from Kingsley PTA. Is there a motion to approve the donation agreement between Kingsley PTA and the board for $19,931.40 for playground construction? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? I do just want to say that uh, for those who haven't maybe gone through this before, this is how we, we just accept these donations because they cannot bid on projects and stuff directly, so that's always done by us. So this is money that we just take as a pass-through um, to, to go towards the playground projects that we're working on. So we have several of them tonight. And then, Darren, I, I know we had a representative from uh, Kingsley who had to leave, um, but before we go through all of these, I, I just, um, on behalf of the board, want to thank everyone for their hard work. Um, Kevin, Bart Oliver as well, having all the, the meetings and Todd with, with all these uh, playground groups, we're, we're very appreciative of, of all of their hard work and, and just the countless fundraisers and the evenings out to restaurants and all of that. Um, it's a lot and uh, we really appreciate everything they do. All right. Piggybacking on that, thanks to the community for all the support for all the schools going through the process. So excellent work by everybody involved. Agreed. Takes a village of Downers Group. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the donation agreement between Kingsley PTA and the board for $19,931.40 for playground construction. Next up is the donation agreement from Pierce Downer PTA. Is there a motion to approve the donation agreement between Pierce Downer PTA and the board for $140,000 for playground construction? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion on that one? Melissa, please go roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the donation agreement between Pierce Downer PTA and the board for $140,000 uh, for playground construction. Next up is the donation agreement for Indian Trail. Is there a motion to approve the donation agreement between Indian Trail PTA and the board for $30,000 for playground construction? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Uh, the, the motion carried to uh, motion carried to approve the donation agreement between Indian Trail PTA and the board for $30,000 for playground equipment. 
Last up in the donations is the donation agreement between Bel Air PTA. Is there a motion to approve the donation agreement between Bel Air PTA and the board for $40,000 for playground construction? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Let's well, please go roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the donation agreement between Bel Air PTA and the board for $40,000 for playground construction. Next up, we have a construction uh, consent agenda. Um, moving forward, we're going to have a second consent agenda on our here for any of the construction projects. Uh, so, our, as I always do with the other consent agenda, is there any item that a board member would like to have considered separately? Um, just the, the um, DLZ, the survey. Just one more question on it. Mm -hmm. The, okay. the top middle school right. top, top, yeah, okay. okay, all right, so, um, is there a motion to approve the construction consent agenda consisting of, um, Just B and C. Uh, of the playground equipment purchases for BCI Burke for Lester, Kingsley, Bel Air, and Indian Trail, and the playground equipment purchase for the landscape structures for Pierce Down. So moved. Is this I or is this me? Second. No, this, this is, is your motion right now. All right, Melissa, we please go roll. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, where was the second? I was the second. Okay. Great. All right. <clears throat> Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried uh, for the consent agenda um, with the exception of item A, the middle school topographical survey proposal. Uh, and it has been approved as, um, as amended in the packet of materials. Next up, is there a motion to approve the middle school topographical uh, survey proposal? So moved. Second. All right, uh, any discussion? Yeah, just, a, uh, just a general question on there's three proposals that came in, a pretty broad range of about $23,000 in difference between the three, so just curious why um, we think there was such a broad, that's, pretty, that's a pretty big, if for such a small amount. Uh, yeah. Of work. Kevin. So we typically do see quite the range in survey yeah. work. Um, I don't know why that is, but whether it's playground work or parking lots or anything like that, um, having experience with all these firms with White, um, we know that these are reliable sources, mm -hmm. and and we felt comfortable in that low bid numbers. You know, sometimes that low bid number concerns. In this case, it does not at all. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the middle school topographical survey proposal. All right, we have a couple of announcements. On Tuesday, December 13th at 7 a.m., the Policy Committee will meet at O'Neill Middle School. Wednesday, January 4th at 3.45 p.m., the Legislative Committee will meet at O'Neill Middle School. On Friday, January 6th at 7 a.m. will be the Financial Advisory Committee, also at O'Neill Middle School. And our next regular board meeting will be on Monday, January 9th at 7 p.m., but that will also be at O'Neill Middle School. Um, we have closed session um, minutes from the November 14th, 2022 meeting. Are there any members that would like to discuss these minutes? No? If not, um, we have to. You need to? I just, no, I, <laughs> <laughs> I I'm sorry. We, we have two. We have <laughs> one little typo. Um, the, the donation from Kingsley, um, it, it's not, it's not 19,000, it's 94,000. The 19,000 is the amount that's getting bid right now in equipment that's going out. But the 90, the donation in the memo is for 94,000. Uh, should I so go back? I just want to note that that was, and I just want to note that on the record well, before we adjourn. Let's reload on that. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks. I will make a motion. To that was the one from Kingsley. Kingsley. And what was the new yes. number? Kingsley is ninety-four thousand three hundred thirty-eight dollars and seventy-five. Ninety-four thousand three hundred thirty-eight dollars and seventy-five cents. All right. Is there a motion to approve the donation agreement between Kingsley PTA and the board in the amount of ninety-four thousand three hundred thirty-eight dollars? and 75 cents for playground construction. So moved. Second. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. 
Uh, the motion carried to approve the donation agreement between the Kingsley PTA and the board in the amount of $94,338.75 for playground construction. Thank you for catching that. And we'll fix that typo and repost it on board doc. So <coughs> get all your Kevin if you have that and you can just email Melissa and we'll get that posted ASAP. All right, so the, was there anyone that wished to go into closed session no. to discuss the, the meeting minutes from November 14th? <laughs> well, considering that we do not have any other items under closed session, okay. um, agenda tonight i was just going to go ahead and move on to the approval of the november 14th 2022 closed session minutes is there a motion to approve the minutes from the november 14th 2022 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of their contents so moved second all right all those in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed all right the motion carried is there a motion to adjourn so moved second all right all those in favor aye aye any opposed all right, the motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned at 9.04 p.m.